Give her a ha and a hi ya and a giggle, sir. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Emily and you are at the home of the Forever Theater Kid and today you are watching another installment of Bloody Broadway. This is my series where I combine my two loves, musical theater and true crime and make them comedic and relatable. I just want to put that this out there. No where should perform am I trying to offend either party. I mean victims never want to offend. That's why I try really hard to be careful about victims but Sometimes the, the perpetrators deserve some crap because they're crappy and they've committed crimes and usually murder. So, these are all my own opinions. I use humor to help me get through, especially times like these, and also to just kind of try to make some of these things make sense to me. So, if True crime and theater are things that you also love. Make sure that you subscribe to my channel. I try to come out with these every week. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok because social media is important to our lives. And let's jump on into it. This week's Bloody Broadway is all about, drum roll please, Anastasia and the House of Romanoff. Since this is such a huge undertaking, I'm splitting this up into two parts. This first video will center on the Romanov family in Imperial Russia and their death, which was... And our second video, which will come out next week, will be all about Anastasia and the scam of the century. The biggest con in history! That's next week. This one is... Dancing bears painted wings so that whole sad stuff that's this week it's nuts all of my sources will be listed down below if you feel the need to fact check me because this is a doozy so if there's something that i really get wrong be kind and correct me down below and we'll have a conversation also if i pronunciate things wrong i'm trying very hard but this is russia imperial russia so from what we know from the movie, right? If you don't, I don't know who you are, why you're here. The movie really doesn't focus on a lot of truth, right? We just know that Anya is an orphan who cannot remember her past and she's trying to find family in Paris because she just feels a calling to Paris. Um, and her, in her flashbacks, we see her, her wonderful family, distant memories. We see in the very beginning, there's this beautiful ball happening in the house of Romanoff and everybody dancing and having a wonderful time. And then this big scary guy named Rasputin, we'll get to him, comes in and is basically like, I put a curse on you because you don't like me anymore. It is my power that takes over everything and makes everything evil and, and that's why all of you die. Well. I hate it when I just hear children crying for no reason, it's creepy. Let's just say the movie isn't entirely at all historically accurate. It's actually far more complicated and far more interesting and very sad and angering and conflicting. And that's history for you, right? Nothing's ever black and white. There's a lot of nuance. We are in Imperial Russia. The Russian dynasty has been ruled by the Romanov family for over 300 years. They are the second ruling class in Russia. Who's the first? I don't know. It's not what this one's about. So from 1613 to 1917, the Romanov family was like ruling all Russia. They were like, we are the kings and the queens and the czars and the tsarinas. Listen to us. We were ordained by God and everybody's like, yes, you are so powerful, we love you so much. From the time that Russia was ruled by the Romanovs, it slowly over time became more and more of an autocratic ruling, which means kind of like a monarchy. There's like one person that dictates everything and like everything goes by their lay of the land. I think that's right. First thing I type in when I get autocracy is Donald Trump. Autocracy, according to Google, is defined as a system of government by one person with absolute power. That's basically what Imperial Russia was for the longest time. <laughs> the Romanovs were an extremely conservative family, a cons very conservative dynasty. Everything was very much centered around their faith of Russian Orthodox. The connection between the Romanovs or any type of czar 
and religion and God were like here. It reminded me very much of the Pope in, in Catholic terms where Romanov's the czar is chosen by God and so therefore it stays within the family because God has blessed this family and so everybody must bow down to this autoc autocratic leader because they're, they're chosen by God. So why would we question it? When an entire society is so conservative and everything is, is based on the religion and everything kind of stems from that religion because there's no separation between church and state, it makes sense as to why there would be no question. But over time, closer and closer to the world wars, that changes dramatically. So the Romanovs were extremely wealthy. Like the amount of what, I, I am dressed in my version of what I own as a Romanov. Just like furs, tiaras, velvets, gold, all of the rubies and sapphire, like so much wealth. You can't even imagine. Like you see Bridgerton now and you're like, wow, that's crazy. Think of that in Imperial Russia, time is a thousand and it was to conserve for them and leave the wealthy to kind of like survive do your own thing but worship me because if you do the world is your oyster and people were like yay and there was much rejoicing but that soon would change when one ruler basically died before people were ready for him to die enter Nicholas II or Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov Anastasia's dad Nikki was going to be the next czar. His dad ruled with an iron fist. It was said that he was a bear of a man, just like the epitome of like brawny Russian ruler. Very well respected, but dude was he feared. He was not to be messed with. And Nikki was just kind of like, I'd rather just sing. Literally, that's the imagery I get. Nicholas was a sweet man. He was very lovable. But in terms of like being ready to be a ruler, he was a bit of a weenie. Anytime that there were times where he was supposed to be trained or time where he was supposed to be educated and the different things of becoming a ruler of all of Russia, have we seen the size of Russia? It, um, he didn't take it very seriously. He was like always hanging out with his friends, ditching classes. Because I think he just never thought he was gonna do it. I think he was like, oh, my dad's gonna live forever. And then one day he met a girl crazy for me. And her name was Alexandra Farad, Alexandra Fia, oh, come on. Alexandra Fia Dorovna, Fia Dorovna, Fia Dorovna. Alexandra Fia Dorovna. She was a German socialite princess, maybe? Princess Alex of Hesse and by Rhine. I don't, she was from Germany. And they met each other, sparks flew, they were in love, head over heels, Bridgerton style, they burned for each other, they were in love. And it really felt like a Meghan Markle and Harry situation. They didn't want to be in the public eye, they wanted everything to be quiet, they just like, they wanted to like burn for each other and that's all they wanted to do. They get married, but guess what? Alexandra's not really well liked. Shocker. Someone from the outside? You didn't marry your cousin? Grandmama did not like Alexandra hated her, despised her, thought she was trash. Alexandra, she felt that, but she was just like, I'm gonna do my best, I'm gonna learn Russian, I'm gonna do everything I gotta do in court, but like nobody liked her. Everybody was like making fun of her all the time, talking shit about her behind her back, and she was just like, this sucks. But at least I've got Nikki, and like we're in love, and we're just gonna like, you know, we're never gonna be Zara and Zarina. We're just gonna like live out our days with so much money, we'll never know what to do with all of it, and maybe we'll have some babies. Well, big, big Hancho, Hancho Czar died. He probably from cholesterol. He was a bear, he was a big dude. He suddenly dies. Without any type of warning, Nikki has to take over. And he is not ready. But Alexandra has to take over his arena. Not ready. She doesn't know any Russian. She doesn't know the ways of the court. She doesn't know anything. Nikki's same. He skipped out on all his classes. He barely knows how to run his own, his own household. He doesn't know how to run an entire country. They're kind of screwed, but guess what? Doesn't matter when you're meant to be the czar. In May 1896, Nicholas is sworn in. He has his coronation. He is the new czar. And there was much rejoicing. Ah! Now, as I mentioned before, the czar looks down upon his people. And if he looks at you, you are blessed. The people of Russia really looked at their czars and their imperial families as saints, as, as deities. They were obsessed, 
and have pictures of them in their home. There's a divine mystical link between the Tsar and its people that they couldn't really explain it. They just felt this great feeling of devotion to the Tsar. They just believed everything that, that a Tsar would say would be true and that they would always take care of them and their people. You know, if they're so close to God, of course they'd be good to their people. And since Nikki grew up, and I keep calling him Nikki like we're buddies, and since Nicholas grew up his entire life knowing that relationship between people and knowing how, how brutish his father was and yet the people still adored him, Nicholas felt like he didn't need the blessing of the people. He just was just like, well, I'm czar now. And, and Alexandra actually felt the same way. She was like, I'm a czarina now. I don't need the people to be affirmed. And boy, did that, that didn't age well. Didn't age well for them. May 18th, right around maybe a, a day or two after the official coronation, a group of people, a very large group of people were going to go celebrate in like a big fair type set setting outside of Moscow. Moscow, 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 first one. Moscow, in Kadinka Fields. This was gonna be a huge celebration in which biscuits and, and souvenir drink Tankards, souvenir tankards were gonna be given to those people. Half a million people showed up for this coronation fair. So a rumor went around that there weren't gonna be enough biscuits and tankards for everyone. I mean, it's half a million people. Although, there could have been that many if you saw these freaking houses that the Imperial family lived in. A rumor spreads, there's a rumor in Katinka Fields. There's panic because everybody wants something. And also, we're living in a time the people of Russia were, were starving. People were hungry. They were thirsty. They they were very, very poor. The idea of getting free food and drink for a day, and then the idea of it being taken away, it was like it was like this feeling of, of mob mentality. So people stampeded to try to get one or two. I mean, hey, freaking how many people's grocery stores and targets were ransacked of freaking toilet paper because people felt like they weren't gonna get enough for their own house. So they took all of it. Like, that type of human mentality never goes away. When you feel like you're going to be without, the mind of some people goes to the place of, I need to take it all for me, rather than stay calm. If we all just take one, maybe we'll be chill. 1,400 people died from this event and 600 people were wounded. Happy Coronation Day. Instead of Nikki, you know, going to the people. Nicholas wasn't there by the way. This was just like a celebration in his name. He got word of this happening and instead of like, I don't know, making a statement, writing a letter, sending a carrier pigeon, instead the Tsarina and the Tsar just like went to a ball that night. You know, some people might argue, well, maybe they didn't hear it in time or what. It just seemed like blatant disrespect. It wasn't a good look. It was all swept under the rug. That situation spread amongst the people and let's just say a lot of people's opinion of the Tsar on his first week wasn't all that great. That stayed with him and kind of haunted his reign and just kind of was the precursor of everything else that was gonna happen. Tsar and Tsarina are married, they're living their truth, they're living their best lives. They think they get to do whatever they want. Well, we're just gonna like live in this like super cute little cottage. Little, it was probably gigantic. Out in the country and we're just like not gonna deal with anyone. We're just not gonna have any responsibilities. And by doing that, by them separating themselves, they are just consistently like driving a wedge between the Imperial family and the people. You know, they thought they were divine beings. So why do they need the care and respect of the people? They don't give a we're the richest people in the world and we're like on top, like why do we care? The zero accountability, people were starting to get pissed. And the veneer of the godlike imperial family started to wane. Love for the family grew when children started to be born. The imperial family was made up of the Tsar and Tsarina, of course, and then also five children. There was Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, and Alexei. Alexandra, our empress, our imperial lady or Zarina. So much pressure on her from the from the gate to have a son. Of course, every monarchy has that type of pressure because everything would go to the male. <laughs> that always works out well. Literally every time a girl was born, like the court would just roll their eyes and like laugh at Alexandra. Like that's the last thing you need to know when you just popped out a child. People are laughing at you. The girls were raised very, very simply. They were raised out in the country. They always dressed the same. They always dressed very innocently and their hair was all long. They all looked very similar to be honest with you. And they were raised to do their own chores, to take care of their own keep, to have very humble upbringing. Considering like what the family had, their upbringing was extremely simple. So it is. it was bizarre. It's like your rich people playing and like the richest of rich. Royalty playing the part of 
poor people playing the part of like middle class in a way like very strange it was like oh how difficult it is to be so rich and have so much money and have so many responsibilities i wish i was poor really went over well with the people like class act and then alexi was born alexei alexei the boy was born there was much rejoicing <laughs> came with some troubles because Alexei, unfortunately, was born with hemophilia. It's a disease in which your blood can't clot, so if he injured in any way or fall badly, it's like he would not stop bleeding. Like, he would bleed internally, he would get very ill, he would get a fever, like it would be really, really bad. And when he would fall, all hell would break loose. And it made his mother very, very like anxious and made the family seclude even more because the last thing that Alexandra and the Tsar uh, and Nikki Nikki wanted was to let the world know that the one male heir that was born is weak as fuck and a little asshole too because they literally treated him like the glass menagerie he was carried everywhere and so that went to the little boy's head very early on and acted like a total brat nobody nobody knew None of the people knew that Alexei was sick. They just knew that he was born and he was there and he was going to be the heir of the imperial dynasty. Anytime that there was uh, riots or political upheavals that were beginning pretty soon, as soon as Alexei was born, Alexandra and her nerves were so tight. She was so nervous that Alexei would be kidnapped, that Nicholas would be murdered. So they just secluded themselves even more. It's like this is where was their bubble and then it just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller and it just felt like nobody was allowed in at all until a creepy creepy dude Rasputin it's actually pronounced Gregory Rasputin he is a creepy mother now we know Rasputin as the weaponized villain in Anastasia cartoon movie it was him and his dark evil powers went against the royal family because the royal family was seen as this like gorgeous like nobody thought they were bad family everything was perfect and that it was Rasputin that turns all the people in one magic spell against him and evil reigns supreme and that's why everything happens that wasn't quite the story best song though in the dark of the night i was tossing and turning and then like my heart was as bad as can be that's bop i love that song gregory rasputin was a siberian like nomad that came to russia in 1903. he was a mystic he was a healer a holy man and this in 1903 this is like the beginning really the height of spiritualism so he would conduct seances he had chants you know people saw him as this being that just kind of knew more than the common man um however he was always a drunk, a big old womanizer, piece of shit. He was like, not the best. Content warning, from here on out, we're gonna start getting into deeper topics and harder to hear topics, including sexual abuse, um, murder, gun violence. It, it just it just goes downhill. The minute Gregory Rasputin enters, everything goes downhill. So if that triggers you in any way, this is your warning. Creepy dude, creepy, creepy dude, was always a drunk. He was very known for being very sexually promiscuous in town. He would go to brothels a lot. You know, I, I really see him as a very particular type of cult leader. One of those that believes himself to be God and that like, so of course he would have all the women. And he was very, very good at manipulating a situation to make people listen to him. Anything that came out of his mouth was law and was the wisest decision to make. There were talks that he actually, he actually held dark magic power that I don't know if he sold his soul to the devil. He definitely inhabited a mystical sensibility to him that, you know, kind of made people like, they didn't feel like, they didn't feel like, oh my God, they were like, it was a little weird. There was one day when Alexi had a really, really bad fall and the doctors in town, wasn't much they could do. Alexandra was terrified that Alexi was gonna die. So she pulled her last straw and was like, okay, bring in Rasputin because that dude, know some stuff that we don't know. And so they bring him in, Rasputin prays over Alexander, prays over Alexei all night, and the next day, somehow, Alexei's fever had gone down, and the swelling and the pain in his leg had also dissipated. In the family's minds, Rasputin had begun to heal Alexei. And from that moment on, Rasputin was in the family picture. Like, he was like in the Christmas card, just like being his like, can you imagine this face in your Christmas card? Maybe some people have someone in their lives that look like that. I'm sorry, but he's, he's creepy. Not 
not only did he heal Alexei, he also healed the nerves of Alexander. She felt like she she had someone to go to fix the things that nobody else could fix. She found her person. However, Alexandra and the Tsar were very aware that Rasputin's reputation in town, in Russia, was not good. And that if people knew that Rasputin existed in the family circle and was as close to the family, that's weird, that's a, that's a weird move. But I guess as a mother, you kind of just feel like there's, there's nowhere else to turn. I can't get comfortable. Really, it's Alexandra when it comes down to it. Alexandra isn't letting anyone in and then she lets in this dude? She lets this guy get close to her kids? If I was a family member, I would be pissed myself. And Alexandra's relationship, especially with her mother-in-law, with the Dowager Empress, was just like, not good. It was just like, tick number one, you don't know Russian. Tick number two, this guy. So what else was weird about Rasputin? Well, he sure was allowed to stay around the girls for far too long in inappropriate times. He was allowed in the nursery. That's weird. That's not right. With the father being away at different war and times when he was like actually being a czar and like doing his job and Alexandra was bedridden because she always had like problems with her sciatica so she was always like lying down and just like, I'm hurting. That's not to diminish her pain but she seemed like kind of an asshole. You know, Rasputin spent a lot of time with the girls and especially when the girls were like prepubescent and pubescent, like he was spending a lot of time with them and they would write him. They would write Rasputin all the time of like passions they were having for boys their age because they didn't have anyone to go to. They were so innocent, they didn't know that it was bizarre to write to a grown ass man about their first crush. They don't have the typical family life where they where they can go to their mom because mom is just like, I'm in bed, I'm tired, I'm hurting, don't talk to me or you're gonna upset me. So they would write to Rasputin to like, Tell them all about like the cute boys that were. There was even thoughts and, and accusations made and worries that Rasputin was getting extremely inappropriate and sexually assaulting the older girls, Olga and Tatiana. And of course back then no one was really gonna believe the children if they claimed that that was happening to them. But also Rasputin was an extremely manipulative, powerful individual. He even said, and I quote, nobody fouls where they eat. What the Rasputin, are you being a creepy son of a bitch with minors? Um, hi John, thank you. Nobody fouls where they eat, thank you so much. Ew! You're, you're disgusting, you're trash. But again, remember, the family is so secluded, they are taking away and away and away and away. And so Rasputin, if he's the only one let in, they don't know what's probably proper and what's good and what's bad about the children, I'm saying. like. What's bad about the situation? Because that's that's the only person, that's the only kind of point of contact that they have with the outside world. The only time that the girls kind of got to learn about the outside world was during World War One. They helped local nurses, so they actually got to interact with people and saw the horrors of what was actually happening with the people. People were hungry and poor and hurting. And the girls could see that because they were going out and actually putting themselves among the people to help for the war effort. But then they'd go home to their like lavish living and just kind of like forget about it or or play house and play poor because that was kind of what they experienced. We're starting to get into politics now. World War One is raging and the people are really experiencing really, really hard times. There's huge social issues and economic issues and and the czar is just so detached from it and not hearing the people and listening to the people and their needs and their desires and and and, and what life is really like and so they're getting super disenchanted with this idea of the czar i mean the world war was devastating the first world war was devastating to every country involved. Shit's hard all around. Any type of food supply or just supplies and materials in general were going towards the war effort. So the people that were back home were freezing. They were starving. They were just holding on for dear life. And Nicholas, was just not stepping up. In terms that are like, kind of, it's black and white, like he wasn't being a man. Especially for back then, he wasn't that strong-fisted, like, Russian man. He kept putting his foot down, he wasn't making big decisions, he was just kind of there. And like, upholding the family name, but not really acting on it. So the respect for him is just dwindling. He's not doing anything to better it. If anything, every decision he's making is the wrong decision. Alexandra is like, yo, you gotta bang your fist and tell the Russian people who's boss. And he's like, oh, that sounds like it's gonna hurt my hand. And she's like, do it. And he's like, I don't wanna know. And so Alexandra's starting to go, oh, my husband's weak as hell. That's, that's cute. And so she turns to Rasputin to be like, hey, can you like, 
give my husband a special sock? Or can you like cut off some of your like beard hairs and send it to my husband? And Rasputin would be like, yeah, like tell him that like these are like my magic hairs. And if he holds on to them as like a lucky talisman, like he'll get whatever he wants. She would literally send and be like, oh, Rasputin stepped on this leaf. It's magic. Hold on to it during war and you'll live. And Nic Nicholas was getting all this like stupid shit he had to hold on to and bring into his like, into his court. And everybody's just like, what the f***? Hold on. What is that? This is from Rasputin. Apparently I wonder war if I have all this in my pocket. So Rasputin is getting, a, is getting a very, very tight hold on Alexandra. He's getting a very, very tight hold on the government. Because since Nicholas was on the front lines, he would leave and entrust the government and the people to Alexandra. Probably the most detached woman of all time. And her idea was just like, well, my husband is not so strong. So I'm going to bring in Rasputin. And, and you know what? I'm going to be like the next Alexandra the Great. Who's Alexandra the Great, Emily? Well, Alexandra the Great. Silly me, I meant to say Catherine the Great. The Great came many, many years before this imperial family. She was basically just like a boss bitch that married into the Romanov line that was like super far down the Romanov line. They weren't even Romanovs anymore, but it was like, they were in line. Dynasties are complicated. She married this dude because she wanted his, you know, she wanted his title because of course she would back then. That's kind of what women did. No shame, play the game. Oh, my husband's an L7 weenie. She literally like made friends with all the guards and all the people in the army and everything. And they like overthrew and, 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 and incited a coup on her husband after 158 days on the job as czar. And was just like, hey, you're not czar anymore. I'm gonna be czarina. We're gonna take the Romanov name because it's down there in that line somewhere and you're not gonna rule anymore. I'm gonna take over, I'm gonna rule, okay? Oh, and guess what? It turned out really good for Catherine the Great. She was very kind to her people, of course rich as hell. Her precedent is kind of what made that divine mystical link even stronger because she cared about the people and she wanted the people to love her. It's what made her wonderful. And so they, they, they bowed down to her. They didn't even question the fact that she overthrew her husband and like took on a lover. They were like, do whatever you want. Bring it back to now, in this time, World War One. Alexandra was just like, oh, I'm gonna be the next Catherine the Great. Like everybody around hates me, but like, that doesn't matter. I'm gonna be the next Catherine the Great. But she didn't give a shit about the people. She didn't care about the people. From this documentary I was watching, she's much more like Marie Antoinette than Catherine the Great. Like, she's got it all wrong. She's got it all, she's got it all wrong. She just cared about power. And she just cared about listening to Rasputin. And she cared about her husband. She loved him dearly, but she knew that he wasn't strong enough. And this situation was not going over well with the other Romanovs. It was not going over well with the Dowager Empress. Dowager Duchess? Yeah. She was like, ah, uh, no, don't like that. Because Rasputin and like Alexandra really thought they were like being sneaky and just like, oh, like, we're just gonna pass you all of our ideas and like how to run this country. Nobody's gonna know, they're gonna know. How would they know? So rumors of Rasputin pulling the strings of the government and how it's being run while Nicholas is away are spreading. Like the call is coming in from inside the house. Nicholas has zero power here. It's all coming from Alexandra and this creeper Rasputin. So we're in 1915 now and big conspiracies are starting to fly around that. Alexandra and Rasputin are actually German spies and they're working to sell out the allies. Wild. But back then, made a lot of sense because Alexandra was taking, she's taking charge. And, and the fact that this guy Rasputin, who nobody had really seen before, kind of in the forefront, and, and where is Nicholas while he's out at war? Like, where where is his opinion coming from? Someone that wasn't strong to begin with and didn't have a good relationship with the people, so where is the loyalty? Where is the like, oh, well, obviously no. Like, obviously no, This they don't know her. They don't know her at all. She has closed herself and they've closed the entire family off, so there is no loyalty to this woman. There's just suspicion. And so this is believed by the people. This is believed by foreign rulers. This is believed by everyone. Even people within the Romanov family. This is a mess. This is a hot freaking mess. The Romanov family was just like, you know what? I don't like this anymore. We're over this. 
So they plotted their own kind of coup. December 16th, 1916. These next couple days is when everything truly starts hitting the fan. Rasputin disappears and the family is devastated. The girls are devastated. They're like, what happened to Rasputin? Creepy, creepy, ghosty friend. Where did he go? And he was captured by different members of the Romanov family who were like nephews. It was very, very close to Nicholas. Very, very like intrinsic people in the family. Captured Rasputin and tried to kill this man in so many different ways. Motherfucker would not die. Let's just say that. They poisoned many a cake with cyanide, like so much cyanide that like it would kill multiple men. Rasputin is just like pop, pop, pop. It's like me when I eat cookies. Like if you saw our holiday show, you, you've seen how I devour cookies. Imagine that on Rasputin. And they're thinking, <laughs> he's gonna be dead in minutes. Did not die, did not die. Then he's beaten mercilessly, doesn't die. And then he gets shot many a time, he dies. That's when he dies. And they take his body to the river, up him in the river. People say that after he was in the river, he was seen popping up. That was kind of just conjecture that like, I don't think that really happened. But he was like the man of like a thousand deaths. I think that was like his nickname. Even more and more the dark magic idea that he sold his soul to the devil, so of course he wouldn't die. But he died. He died really. It was a pretty bad death. When the news got to the family, they were devastated because again, this man was their confidant. The mother was really not present for them, for the girls and Alexei. They thought that he was like saving Alexei's life every single day, except Olga. She was just like, y'all, this is a good thing. He was bad news. He was bad news bears. The murder of Rasputin was the Romanov family's idea of neutralizing the situation. If we get Rasputin out and then get Alexandra out, bring the power back to Nicholas, the extended Romanov family is thinking, this is what's gonna bring the Tsar back. This is what's gonna make him extend to the people. That relationship's gonna mend. It's gonna be great. History repeats itself, friends. History repeats itself. Every single step of the way of what they tried to do completely backfired. If anything, Nicholas and Alexandra seclude even more and more and more. They keep their family very tight. Nobody knows what's happening. So they're not taking any more advice from outside. They're not bringing anybody else in. And this is what inevitably dooms the family. So within the next year, shit is hitting the fan with the Russian people. They are done. They are so done with the government. Nobody is helping them. They are rioting because they are hungry and and tired and, and just not taken care of by the richest people in the entire world. If they had just sold or if they had just given away one of their castles, they probably could have fed the entire Russian population. There's so much wealth. It was... It makes me so mad. Eat the rich. But with the family secluding more and more, they are completely out of touch with reality. They don't know what's happening. They don't care what's happening because it's not happening to them. In February of 1917, there are eight days of violent protests and riots leading to Bloody Sunday. Which... I was incorrect. Bloody Sunday was in 1905. It was kind of like the precursor to the rest of the revolution. So I'm pretty sure that the, in February, it was kind of the start of like the Russian revolution of the beginning of the dismantling of the monarchy, the autocracy, only because of what a lack of leadership was coming from Nicholas in the war effort. Which culminates in 1,300 deaths. The Russian government was just like, kill these people who are rioting because they don't align with us. And even like the army, the Russian army was just like, hmm. They said, fuck this noise. I'm siding with the people. And with that, it became a revolution. They wanted the czar down because he wasn't doing anything to help them. If anything, he was hindering the the Russian people, there was no more alliance, there was no more allegiance to the imperial family. They wanted him out. So after much deliberation, Nicholas steps down, he relinquishes his power to his brother, the Grand Duke, Michael Alexandrovich. And they thought that this would be the only way for the revolution to calm down. So not only does that relinquish power to Nikolai, but also to Alexei. No more Romanovs, no more czars, it's done. So on March 2nd, 1917, he abdicates the throne, three centuries worth of Romanov dynasty, and he says, bye, take it, like, I'm done, I'm over it. Such a disappointment. The Duke, um, the Duke, not this Duke, not you, this Duke. The Duke refuses to take imperial authority. No, 
That's what got us here in the first place. We're not, we're not doing that again. So instead of overseeing an autocratic government, there's a provincial democratic government taking place. No one really knows what's going on, but they're trying. They're trying something new, but it's like, times is hot. Like, people are mad, and they want change, but they don't really know what kind of change they want. They just want change. What's our plan? And I could be getting a lot of this wrong, so if I'm getting a lot of this wrong, you may correct me down below. But since that government, the provincial government, was not the strongest, these dudes named the Bolsheviks kind of were like, it looks pretty weak over here. Let's go in. Let's just open the door. And they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. Nicholas and his family are no longer the imperial family. And since they had to abdicate the throne in such an embarrassing way, and there was a revolution, it didn't get too great for them from here on out. The family was put on house arrest. What's interestingly enough, a family that was so secluded and, and prided themselves on being so secluded, when they were actually forced to be secluded, their beautiful home being started to become a prison to them. It wasn't really prison for them, they just kind of couldn't go anywhere. They were just under constant surveillance. Eventually, about five months later, after their initial house arrest, the family was exiled to Siberia for their own protection because more shit was going down in Russia. The family really thought that they would eventually be let go and just could go on and live a simple life, maybe be farmers. There was an idea that maybe they'd be like asylumed to England, but the girls were very ill at the time, so they couldn't kind of, the timing just didn't work out. And then people in England were like, we don't, need that. So they kind of lost any chance of being able to escape and so they were exiled to Siberia. Can you imagine season of oppression in Siberia? I couldn't. So in October of that same year, the radical Marxist Bolshevik party takes over Russia because they saw the instability in the government and they were like, now's our time to strike. We're going to do our own thing and everybody's going to listen to us. They're led by this dude named Vladimir Lenin who capitalized in the instability of the new regime and he seized power with an extremely decisive and violent military coup. Coup after coup after coup. They just love a coup in Russia. So the family's moved again, but this time they're under the gaze and they're under the, the um, authority of the Bolsheviks. I don't know if they were under the authority of the Bolsheviks before, but this time they're definitely under the authority of the Bolsheviks. And and things just felt different this time. Bolsheviks didn't want there to be any type of a chance that sympathizers to the imperial family, aka the white Russian army, the counter-revolution, were going to save them. Even though in Siberia their, their seclusion was like super remote and during the winter there was no way possible for anyone to come and save them. They didn't want to take any freaking chances. So the family was separated. For the first time in this in this entire revolution, the family's separated. So the family is moved out to, okay. Hey Siri, pronounce this word. Y-E-K-A-T-E-R-I-N-B-U-R-G. Good, you Yekaterinburg. Yekaterinburg. Check it out. The Bolshevik party sends the Romanovs to Yekaterinburg, Russia. It is a thousand miles from Moscow. They sent him to this house called the Impatiev Impatiev House, aka the House of Special Purpose. I would shit my pants if I knew that I was being sent to a place called the House of Special Purpose. And it was very clear to the Bolsheviks what that special purpose was going to be. A life for the Romanovs became like prison. They were being extremely uh, under the gaze of this new dude named Yurovsky. He made life a lot harder for them, much stricter rules, but he treated them with quote unquote professionalism. And the czar like respected him. He was just like, you know, you're asking, you got a job to do and I respect you for it. I don't know why the czar became Jerry Seinfeld, but that's what he sounds like in my head. Like an extreme form of house arrest for this family. And it just had a different air about it. They just felt sad, you know, like, Letters, letters that have been found, you know, Anastasia would write letters to her tutor. They just feel weird. I'm sad. I'm very sad. And it's really, it's really upsetting. Like, all the children have to suffer this as well. And it's just like, I didn't, they didn't deserve it. But since the girls were so sweet and getting older and like in their early 20s, the guards took a liking to them. They would give them books sometimes to read. They would laugh with them. But, you know, Yurovsky was just like, Enough is enough. They were at the house of special purpose for a very special purpose. They had a mission to do. They knew that that family was never gonna get out of that house alive. But the Romanovs kind of thought, we're gonna get out of this. 
we're gonna live. We're gonna get out of this. But then unfortunately, the house of special purpose got the call for its special purpose on July 17th, 1918. This whole time that they're in this house of special purpose, Yurovsky is waiting for Vladimir Lenin to give his call to execute the family. The call was given, and at 1.30 in the morning, Yurovsky leads the entire family down into the basement of the House of Special Purpose. The family had no idea. The family was under the assumption that there was danger in town. They were bringing the family down into the basement to basically protect them. When in reality, the White Russian Army was not too far away, maybe about 20 miles away, and they were panicking that they were gonna come and rescue them. So, in the Bolsheviks' mind, they needed to do away with them. Trigger warning, this part gets really fucking dark. A lot of gunshot, it's bloody, it's gory, if you need to move on. So, they lead them down into the basement. Yurovsky, who was a former photographer, lines the entire family up on the wall, and in this, like, poses them as if they're going to be taking, like, a family portrait which is so fucked up. When in reality, he lines them up in such a way so it will be easier for every single marksman to hit their mark because there was a, a gunman for every single person that was gonna be murdered that night. Not only was it the Romanov family, but it was also the lady's maid, the, the cook, valet that was with them. Basically, anyone that was there to serve the Romanovs was also lined up in this photo. Drosky starts reading their certificate of death and like Nicholas is like, whoa, 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 I thought we were getting out of this. And he finishes their certificate of death and the first one to be shot is Nicholas. And then all hell breaks loose. They really thought this was gonna be like quick one and done, but it's a bloodbath. These people were hired and brought on to kill the Romanov family because they hated the Romanovs. That was their purpose, special purpose. But they weren't trained marksmen. The guns are just fired. So there's blood splurting everywhere. There's smoke everywhere. Alexandra is shot in the head, so she is killed instantly. But all the children were, were not. Like they were, they were shot in areas where it, it, it made them either unconscious or just in pain. And when that didn't kill them, they were bayoneted to death. Children, two children. When they weren't killed by being shot at point blank range, they were bayoneted to death. Some thought like miraculous and some thought creepy. Girls, when they were shot at originally, it said that the bullets were ricocheting off of them, not because they were holy beings, but because they had actually sewn their rubies and their jewels into their dresses in case if they were let go, that they would be able to provide for their family in some way. And nobody knew that their undergarments and their bras and their underwear were literally full of rubies and diamonds. They may have been hit by bullets and injured, but it wasn't piercing their skin immediately. Hence, the need for the Bolsheviks to bayonet them. And even bayonets weren't even going through. That's when the Bolsheviks decided to finish the job with a bullet to the head. It was rumored that, um, I'll go into this more in part two of this video, yes, there will still be a part two, of Anastasia and her death specifically. According to fact and how this whole scene went about, it seems very improbable that anybody could have escaped. But then they were like, oh, the white Russian army is still on our doorstep, so we have to get rid of these bodies. So they put acid on the bodies to try to be like, Ugh. You don't know who this is. Well, that wasn't really taking. They were trying to burn the bodies. That wasn't really taking either. And so then they were like, okay, what's the next best thing? Throw them in a mine shaft. Yeah, that's a great way, Yosevic. So much respect for the dead. But the mine shaft was not as deep as they expected. It was only nine feet deep and the water that was at the bottom of the shaft did not cover the bodies. But there's a lot of bodies there and they knew that people were looking for a certain amount of people who were Romanoff line, that were the royal family, so they knew it would be obvious if anybody found this ground. So what do they do? Oh, Emily. They pour more f acid onto the bodies. Ugh. Well, they cover them up crudely enough and we'll discuss much more in the next video but the bodies aren't discovered for many, many, many years. House of Special Purpose was eventually torn down and the spot in which the bloodbath that was the death of the Romanov family was the site in which they built a huge church, the Russian Orthodox faith. 2007, I believe it was, 
the family, mainly the children, were sainted. They're held up to much high regard and people can go to the church now. I mean, honestly, it's like a Mecca. It's like, it's a pilgrimage for people of the Russian Orthodox faith to go and visit because the girls were canonized and the children, I think Alexei too. I think it's just the children that were canonized. Kind of been held up to this mythical standard where it's like they died a horrible death and the children did not, again, the children did not deserve that. But like the actions of the family, the actions of the Romanovs, the crimes, the crimes, this like true crime family, this whole like insidious shit that went on with this family killed so many Russian civilians. Their actions were the precursors of so many riots, so much upheaval, the stampede on coronation day, like so many deaths came about because this guy could not pull up his pants and rule his people. His lady wanted power too much and they were just so obsessed with secluding themselves. It's like you can't have both worlds. Nicholas royally fucked up. He didn't take ownership. He didn't step up and be a czar and lead the people. He and Alexandra led their entire family to ruin. Did they deserve that type of death? Absolutely not. That was brutal. But were these people led to a point that they thought that was the only choice and that was their political gain? That's clearly what had happened. There's no excuse to kill the to kill the family like they did. There was no excuse. There's no excuse to bring the children into that. Who knows? The children could have done amazing things in their. They could have been shitheads, but they could have done amazing things in their lives. They were never given the opportunity to do so. Especially Olga. She seemed like she was like ready to change the world. She probably would have been the next Catherine the Great. I don't know the pressures. Clearly. <laughs> of a royal family. In that time, a duty's a duty, and like, I mean, they clearly just kind of became this, <laughs> this, this tale of like, well, don't be like the imperial family. You know, the people rioted, and the, and the people protested, and the people wanted their way, but I don't even think the government that was created after the whole upheaval of the autocracy, like, that's not even what the people wanted. That's not even what the people needed. Still, life was hell. They still suffered greatly. But all was just shit. And not only was the Romanovs killed, but there was like a huge purge of anyone that was related to the Romanovs, you know, could potentially be sympathized into being a, a czar again, a monarchy again. And Oh, and finally, forgot to say, when the Romanovs were killed, only the death of Nicholas was announced to the people. The Bolsheviks did not did not disclose the fact that they not only brutally murdered the former czar, but also his entire family. Because they knew that if they did that, that the people would be like, it's not what we said we wanted. Why did you do that? To keep the people on the Bol Bolshevik side, they kind of gave them the head of the person that they wanted. Them not even knowing that the family died. Of course, rumors of the possible survival of some of the family members, mainly one lone princess, sparked a rumor around an entire nation that is still believed today. But I will leave that for our next video, so tune in to next week. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know that this was long and convoluted. I, I did my best to shorten it and to make it as concise and entertaining as possible. But I think to tell the story of Anastasia, especially how, how we know it in musical theater world, Anastasia the musical, it's important to know the background and the atrocities that happened underneath the Romanov rule and also the death of the Romanov family. So yeah. That is the complicated story of the Romanov curse, the Romanov line. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to tune in for next week's episode in which we really dive into Anastasia and how it relates to the musical. I would love it if you would subscribe to my channel and also give this video a thumbs up. It would mean a lot if you would give this video a thumbs up and possibly a comment because that really just helps my videos get seen by not only you, but also by more people who might like this video and just don't know what to click on. Feed my info into the algorithm so that YouTube is like, oh, this is worthy of going on someone's related page. So if you could do that for me, that would be really, really great. I would love you forever. And tell me, like, what are your thoughts on this? I will leave all of my resources that I used and got my information from down below in the description. Just seems like history just constantly repeats itself and we never freaking learn, do we? As always, give me your hands if we be friends and Robin shall restore amends.